Hello, my name is John Pankowski. I'm a litigation attorney with Pankowski Hauser in West Palm Beach, Florida. For the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to be speaking to you about Florida guardianship matters. Specifically, five scary things about Florida guardianships that you may not have known. Uh, this webinar is free of charge. It's intended as a lay webinar for the lay person, the, the non-professional, the non-lawyer who may have questions about Florida guardianships, how a guardianship is created, the different players who are involved in guardianships, uh, as well as a basic knowledge of how Florida guardianships affect people as well as family members. This is brought to you by my law firm, Pinkowski Hauser, which is based in West Palm Beach, Florida, but we have an active practice throughout the Sunshine State. We have matters throughout the state of Florida or limited to litigation and administration of probates, wills, trusts, estates, guardianships, and appellate matters. So with that said, I'm going to be speaking to you about various topics. I'm going to be giving you a broad introduction about Florida guardianship matters. I'm going to speak to you specifically about the guardianship of an adult, because we're not talking about a guardianship of a minor. And that's kind of what many people think about is when they hear the word guardian, they think about a minor. Uh, this is not the case. This is not what we're discussing today. We're going to be discussing guardianships of adults. I'm going to talk about why a guardianship may be needed, what laws are appropriate, uh, and what laws you can read for free uh, online if you want to learn more about Florida guardianship law. I'm going to be speaking to you about the legal actors, right? what I call the legal actors, the people who will be involved in either your guardianship or the guardianship matter that you're involved in. I'll talk about five things that I've referred to as five scary things about guardianships. These are five things that um, may be frightening to some, that some people may not think about may not realize, may not quite understand about a guardianship. Because when we talk about guardianships, we're talking about a court intervening in someone's life over very serious and important issues, right? We're talking about human rights, civil liberties, the right of freedom, right? Um, that's what a guardianship does or is involved in or at least considers. And in many instances, you'll see that a guardianship court will take away those liberties and those freedoms and those rights. Uh, in an effort to protect a person. Um, so we'll talk about five things that we've recognized from handling a contentious or litigated guardianship matters. Um, and then we'll conclude. Um, so let me start uh, with an introduction about five scary things about Florida guardianships. And, and the first thing I think to say is that um, the trial lawyers and appellate lawyers in my firm uh, never envisioned handling guardianship matters like 15 years ago. We were probate litigation lawyers. We handle a lot of will contests, bank account litigation, um, the family disputes when somebody passes away or when there's a trust, right? We, we have uh, a lot of Florida trust matters. But guardianship litigation has actually uh, exploded in Florida. The number of cases um, that are filed in the guardianship context has increased and probate court judges now throughout Florida have a lot more guardianship cases than they had 15 years ago. And at our firm, Pinkowski Hauser, uh, we handle now regular uh, sets of guardianship matters and have so for a few years now. So the guardianship practice, that uh, component of our firm's fact practice is very, very important, um, as well as um, very important to many families, right? Because increasingly folks are going to uh, probate court, to a guardianship court and saying, hey, somebody needs assistance, somebody needs help, I need to set up a guardianship. And so you might have a petitioner who files a petition that goes to the probate court and says, hey, somebody needs a guardianship. And my law firm helps people like that. Uh, but by the same token, my law firm also represents a number of family members in guardianship matters who are respondents, the people who learn about the guardianship petition, who learn about the guardianship filing and say, hey, um, I want to be involved in this guardianship or hey, um, I don't think we need a guardianship uh, or I don't like the guardian, let's change the guardian. And so we try to use the law and the facts of a particular case to help family members, many times their spouses, many times their uh, adult sons and daughters or, or siblings. Um, so today we're going to be speaking about the guardianship of an adult, right? Not the guardianship of a minor. In, in, in Florida, we know that in many instances, parents can bind or act for a minor child, but many times we need a guardian appointed for a minor child, such as if there's property involved, such as if a, a child 
inherits a lot of money um, and they're under 18. Many times we need a guardian and we need a formal guardianship process for that minor and that minor's property. We're not talking about guardianship of minors today, we're talking about guardianship of adults, right? Somebody who through advanced years or frailties, maybe dementia or Alzheimer's or neurological challenges, is starting to need some assistance, right? They're slowing down. They may or may not be incapacitated or incompetent, but they need some assistance, right? So why is a guardianship needed? Generally, we think of a guardianship as being needed when somebody can't make their own decisions. Maybe they can't uh, determine um, what care they should receive or where they should live. Maybe they just can't handle their business affairs, right? They can't manage money. They don't remember to pay property taxes, um, HOA fees, insurance. Um, maybe they are incapable of filing their income taxes and remembering to file their income taxes every single year. So a, <clears throat> a guardianship is often needed when somebody needs assistance with some of their rights. And that's typically to, due to a, a, a decreased mentality, right? A, a, a increase in incompetency or a challenge with their capacity. That, that's kind of lawyer speak for saying people are slowing down and they're incapable of handling their day-to-day -day affairs uh, and managing what some people call their business affairs. So uh, in some instances, somebody might be completely incapacitated and they're totally incapable of managing their affairs, determining their level of care, determining um, uh, the, uh, or having the ability to pay their bills, pay their expenses, take care of their day-to-day -day needs, right? Totally incapacitated. They may or may not know who their family members are, but clearly they need assistance on the day-to-day -day and living on their own. Um, and that's kind of one extreme, right? The other extreme is to have a, a voluntary guardianship where somebody says, hey, I'm, I'm doing fine, but I'm slipping a little bit, and I recognize I need a little assistance, right? In Florida, you can have a voluntary guardianship where somebody goes forward to the probate court because probate courts in Florida hear guardianship matters. Um, and they say, um, I want to do a voluntary guardianship. Um, I need a little assistance, and I want to say who my guardian is going to be. And oftentimes we have the gray area, right? We, we have family members who call the lawyers in our firm and say, you know, mom or dad or my aunt or my uncle is slipping or maybe my grandmother or grandfather. I don't know if they need a guardianship. And so sometimes we spend a lot of time speaking to family members, many of them out of state. In fact, probably most of them from out of state who have a relative living in Florida. And we talk to them about whether a guardianship is even needed or not. And we're going to be talking about whether a guardianship is needed later today in this webinar. We're going to talk about how people can avoid a guardianship by having an estate plan in place, and you may not need a guardianship. Um, so big gray area many times on whether somebody is incompetent or incapacitated uh, or in need of a guardianship. Because in Florida, the court, the judge, may determine that somebody is incapacitated or not competent, but there's no need for a guardian, and we'll learn why. Um, finally, what laws govern um, guardianships in Florida? In Florida, many people know, many probate lawyers know, that we have a probate code, we have a trust code, we also have a guardianship code. That's chapter 744 of the Florida statutes. And any guardianship litigator will tell you that they they always have a copy of the Florida Probate Code. This is the 2018 edition. It has a number of statutes or laws in it. It has the Guardianship Code, Chapter 744, the Probate Code, the Trust Code, as well as um, um, certain rules like the Florida Probate Rules, and it has um, the Evidence Code, right? And that's very important to a probate litigator, a guardianship litigator, because in Florida, there's a number of very, very good estate planning lawyers and elder law lawyers who go to court often. They, they open up estates, um, they file for guardianship, they open up a guardianship, um, but they don't really litigate, right? And so if you're involved in a family dispute over a guardianship, a very contentious one, um, you may want to consider getting a litigator, somebody who's familiar with how to introduce evidence, the rules of trying to prohibit certain evidence from coming in, um, who understands making objections, examining and cross-examining witnesses, how to build a case, how to prepare and attend trial. A lot of elder law lawyers in Florida, a lot of guardianship lawyers in Florida do a really good job, but
but they don't try cases or handle appeals. So if you think that it's going to be contentious or it's, it's going to be, there's going to be a big family fight, um, you may want to add a litigation attorney to your legal team. So <clears throat> let's talk about um, guardianship teams now. Let's talk about guardianship terms. And let's talk about the legal players or the legal actors. <clears throat> let's talk about six of them. Um, one is your power of attorney. A power of attorney in Florida um, is a document where you, the creator of the power of attorney, grants to somebody authority. Uh, and the authority can be very, very broad. You can do anything that I can do or it can be very limited. Um, help me with the sale of this house. You can sign the closing documents or you can invest the funds or something like that. In Florida, powers of attorney do not survive one's incapacity, right? Uh, but durable powers of attorney do. So you want a durable power of attorney and who you name as your power holder, your attorney in fact, who's a fiduciary is very important because that power of attorney document, that durable power of attorney document survives your incapacity. So if you grant someone power, right? If you grant power to someone, often what we call a power of attorney or an, uh, an attorney in fact, that person can make decisions for you even when you're unable to, even when you're incapacitated. It's a very important legal actor in the guardianship. Uh, why? Because a probate court judge is going to want to know whether there's a valid power of attorney out there. Uh, because if there is, the judge is going to have to consider that. Because in Florida guardianship matters, even if someone is incapacitated or incompetent, a guardian won't necessarily be appointed if there's a proper estate plan in place or what, what guardianship law firms refer to as, um, is there a plan in place, is there an alternative to a guardianship that adequately addresses the needs of the person who's the subject of the guardianship, right? Now, a person who is the subject of a guardianship is often referred to as the AIP, alleged incapacitated person. And, and if a probate court judge declares that that person, that alleged incapacitated person is actually incapacitated, they become a ward. They become known as a ward, W-A-R-D. And, and many times we use those terms interchangeably even though a ward usually speaks of some type of hearing or trial, some adjudication, that somebody who is believed to be incapacitated has been adjudicated incapacitated. It's been ruled by a probate court judge that this person is, is incapacitated. So a court is going to consider if somebody is incapacitated, is there an estate plan in place that adequately addresses the needs of the ward? And, and so do we need a full-blown guardianship or can we protect the ward? Can we manage the ward's property, take care of him or her, address all their needs without a guardianship? Can we have a power of attorney or a property manager make all their decisions for them? That's the struggle that a lot of probate courts go through when somebody files for guardianship um, and somebody wants a guardian appointed to represent somebody who was alleged to have been to be incapacitated and is, is later judged to be incapacitated, the ward. Um, and courts grapple with that. And many times family members will fight over that, right? They'll say, um, well, I know mom or dad had a power of attorney, but I don't want that person being the power of attorney and making decisions. Or I think that power of attorney was procured improperly. Uh, it was done under facts and circumstances that make it void, right? And so sometimes family members fight over that. Um, ask any probate litigator and they'll tell you that there's a very specific pr provision in the Florida uh, Guardianship Code about filing a verified statement that if you believe in good faith that an estate plan or a revocable trust or a power of attorney is invalid, um, that can have a lot of uh, litigation implications, right, if you're saying that. Now we know when a guardianship matter is filed, it suspends a power of attorney. So if you're concerned that somebody has a power of attorney over somebody and a guardianship action has been filed, talk to your probate litigator about giving notice to people who may want to know that a guardianship matter has been filed. If somebody comes in with the power of attorney to use it, don't recognize it because it's been suspended by Florida law. And you can unsuspend it in probate court as well. Power of attorney, one of the the, one part of your, your, your guardianship team, one legal actor 
in this guardianship matter. Um, the trustee of your revocable trust. Most people, in addition to having a will, have a revocable or a living trust. And the revocable or living trust, typically we think of that as um, property management for your estate when you pass away, right? A revocable trust says, when I pass away, um, give money here, give money to so-and-so, leave an inheritance here. But a revocable trust also tells us what to do with your property while you're living, right? So it says, hey, trustee um, of my revocable trust, um, pay all my bills and take care of me and you can give money to me or my spouse or maybe just to me for my health education maintenance and support right that's typically a revocable trust during your life it benefits you and only you and then at your passing at your death it's distributed to your chosen beneficiaries might be family members might not be family members might be charities it might not be and so a revocable trust and who your trustee is of your revocable or living trust becomes really important if you're incapacitated because that trustee is going to take over, at least on paper, or have the ability to take over and manage all your property. And many times, times in a guardianship matter, the person with the power of attorney will gather your property, put it into your revocable trust, and it'll be managed by your trustee. As you can imagine, family members sometimes fight over who's going to manage your property, who's your trustee of your revocable trust, if there's a guardianship matter filed. Do you need a guardian or can you get by managing your property with a power of attorney and the trustee of a revocable trust? Who you select in these fiduciary roles is very important. So speak to your estate planning lawyer Spend some time analyzing who you want to be your power of attorney, who you want to be the trustee of your revocable trust. Because remember, um, you're going to need those people the most when you're unable to care for yourself. Um, and your estate planning attorney should know you the best and also have some very specific recommendations on who may be appropriate for your fiduciaries, who's going to manage your property if you're unable to. Um, your health care decision maker. Who makes health care decisions for you if you're unable to, if you're incapacitated or incompetent? Talk to your estate planning lawyer about who you want to put in charge of your health care decisions, right? In some states, we call these documents health care proxies. Uh, we call them health care advanced directives in Florida. Uh, some people refer to them as medical durable powers of attorney. Um, and, and those are empowering documents. Those are documents where you give somebody the authority to make decisions for you. So in a guardianship court, if you don't have those documents and you're incapacitated, a probate court judge is going to appoint somebody to make those decisions for you. But if you have those documents already in place, a judge is going to consider whether those documents adequately address your needs and they're going to consider whether um, those people that you've appointed are really going to do what's in your best interest. And sometimes family members like second or third spouses and adult children from a prior relationship uh, will have a legal fight about who's going to make health care decisions, right? And we have to determine whether that health, those health care documents are valid or proper or not, right? Um, you can also have other health care documents that set forth your intent, like what you want such as a living will or a DNR, a do not resuscitate order, where you can put down in, 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 uh, in writing on paper whether you want to be sustained artificially on a machine or ventilator or not. Um, the, the next legal player in Florida guardianship is the spouse of the war, right? So if you're the subject of a guardianship matter, that spouse is an important person. Why? Because generally most spouses end up being a caretaker or the main caretaker, even if there's nurses assistants or others who assist with the care. Um, and spouses have a very special legal status in Florida. For example, you have to support your spouse during your marriage, even if you signed a prenup, right? That's really, really important. So in the case of second and third marriages, this gets a little challenging sometimes, right? You can imagine a marriage where um, somebody has married for the second or third time, there's a prenuptial agreement, they're living together as husband and wife, one becomes incapacitated, um, and 
the person who's incapacitated has a trust and a power of attorney, but those documents name that person's children, adult children from a prior marriage or relationship, as the ones who are in charge of everything. So now you have children on paper who may not live in Florida, may not be taking care of mom or dad, making all the financial decisions and managing dad's money or mom's money when they're incapacitated. And this can be uncomfortable for that second or third spouse who signed the prenup, right? Because a spouse in Florida, even if you're incapacitated, has an obligation to support their spouse, right? And so, but if that one spouse is incapacitated, you're kind of leaving the other spouse to almost ask those adult kids for, for money. Um, and that can be uncomfortable for, for a lot of family members. And it gets even problematic when that second or third spouse actually is in a relationship with the incapacitated person that worked. That's a successful marriage, a, a loving marriage, and particularly when that spouse is the day-to-day -day caretaker uh, for that person, taking them to uh, the doctors, um, assisting the caretakers with their care and feeding and bathing, um, picking up all the prescriptions and everything, right? Really a, a part-time or full-time job. Spouse, very important legal actor, part of the, this guardianship team. Um, and then uh, we have two more groups of legal actors, interested persons. Who else can participate in a Florida guardianship? Uh, the answer is not everybody, right? You need some standing or connection to the guardianship matter to the person who's the subject of the guardianship. Um, and so generally we, we think of those people who can participate in a guardianship as interested persons. You have an interest in the outcome of this proceeding. You have an interest in the ward. You have an interest in something or somebody related to this guardianship proceeding that would permit you to come in off the street and hire a lawyer and be heard by a judge and file documents and have a say uh, in the guardianship, such as who the guardian is, or whether we even need a guardian, or whether the power of attorney is valid, or who's the trustee of the revocable trust. Are you an interested person? And what's interesting is you would think that all family members are always interested, and non-family members may never be interested, and that's just not the case. Uh, the district courts of appeal throughout Florida have been getting more and more appeals for guardianship matters, and they're issuing written opinions that are very helpful to probate litigators like the lawyers at my firm. Um, and we see increasingly that children um, cannot be considered or are not considered interested persons under certain circumstances. And sometimes a close neighbor or a non-blood relative, a non-marital, a non-spouse um, or a friend is considered um, an interested person. So it really can vary. Finally, the judge is a legal actor. That judge who's going to hear your case is a very important person, right? In Florida, guardianship matters are filed in probate court, so you're going to get a probate court judge. And, the, you know, the divisions rotate here. You, you might be in criminal, the criminal division here in criminal cases for a couple of years, and then you go to the civil division where you hear a breach of contract cases or personal injury cases, and then you go to probate. And so... A, a judge may be new to guardianship, uh, and it's the lawyer's role to assist that judge in, in, in learning about guardianship law and, and explaining and assisting with the procedure. Um, but that judge is really going to be focused um, mainly on the best interests of the ward, the person who is alleged to be incapacitated. And my experience, uh, having done a number of guardianships, contentious guardianships where family members are fighting is that judges really do a great job. They really bend over backwards uh, to get through the mess and get through uh, the tough litigating that goes on to really try to help the ward, to try to help the person who's in, in, in need of assistance. And so judges are really focused on what's in the best interests of this ward, who should be the guardian, who shouldn't be the guardian, who's telling the truth, who's being too emotional, uh, what can I do to help this person? Because at the end of the day, if you have a guardianship, remember what we said at the beginning. Guardianship's a serious business. A court's going to take away someone's rights. A court is going to affect someone's uh, human rights and civil liberties. And, and a court, when, when a guardianship is created, right, a court is going to say, uh, this person is incapacitated, um, that's the mental health proceeding that's part of a guardianship proceeding. And, and the court's going to take away certain rights. It might be the right to vote, the right to travel, um, the right to associate. Um, but a judge removes certain rights and sometimes 
may remove all your rights. And so it's serious business. And my experience is that judges recognize that they understand that. And they really bend over backwards to do a great job to try to protect and help this person who's in need. Okay, that's guardianship terms, teams, and the players. Um, now let's turn to kind of the main topic of today, the five scary things, the, the five things that you may not know about guardianships that uh, may shock you. The first scary thing about a guardianship is um, we just took away all your rights, right? That's a guardianship, right? There's almost two sides to that legal coin. You can look at a guardianship as saying, I need to help somebody. I need to protect somebody. Somebody is incapacitated or diminishing or slowing down and they're vulnerable. They're a vulnerable adult and people could financially exploit them. Um, they need protection, and, and, and that's absolutely true in many cases, right? I mean, regrettably, Florida has almost its unfair share of financial exploitation of the elderly, people doing bad things with powers of attorney and putting themselves on the deeds and the bank accounts and creating beneficiary designations when they shouldn't. But um, the truth is, if a guardianship is created, um, a court's taking away at least some of your rights, and sometimes people don't realize that serious stuff. The second scary thing about guardianships uh, is we just took control of all your property. Right? In Florida guardianship law, a judge can appoint a guardian of your person. They'll make all personal decisions for you. Everything for, for example, like where you're going to live, the level of care you're going to receive, um, how many nurses assistants you're going to need or, or obtain, um, where you're going to reside, the level of care you're going to get, what doctors that you're going to see, um, how are you going to be fed, um, etc. There may also be a guardian of the property. Who's that person who's going to gather all your assets, safeguard them, manage them prudently, and then distribute them for your benefit? It might be distributing them to the guardian of your person to pay your bills or to assist with getting you what you need your lifestyle, your health care, food, clothing, shelter, et cetera, et cetera. Or the guardian of the property may just write all, all those checks anyways and pay all those bills. So if you're incapacitated, you're not going to be controlling your property. A guardian is going to be appointed, who's going to be in charge of all your property. And that's why earlier when we talked about a power of attorney, an estate plan, a trustee of a revocable trust, who you choose as your fiduciaries uh, is very important. Um, the third scary thing that sometimes people don't tell you about a Florida guardianship is we're putting you on a budget. Um, and that can be a little disconcerting for not only the person who's incapacitated, but their spouse, right? Um, guardianship is serious business in Florida. The guardian has to file annual reports, budgets, has to account for every single penny, tell the court what they use or didn't use money for, um, has to be cautious about fees, costs, and expenses, including attorney's fees. Uh, it's serious business. It requires work. It requires some training. Um, and so generally um, what occurs is there's some type of a budget. There's some type of a budget where the interested persons evaluate and the judge decides on how much money or how much property should be used for the benefit, benefit of the ward and sometimes the ward and the spouse. So there's typically going to be some type of budget so the court and the guardian and the other interested persons know, um, look, there's some accountability. We're not just spending money willy-nilly. Um, and, and this becomes particularly important when somebody has a revocable trust, right? Because when we have a revocable trust, there's typically remainder beneficiaries, right? This money shall be used for the ward during their life. When the ward passes away, where does it go? Read the trust. And so we need to be mindful of those remainder beneficiaries. Most of the time, most of the time, recognize that most revocable trusts say, um, distribute money for the creator, in our example, the person who's now incapacitated, and you can spend all the money uh, for my benefit. You can spend all of the trust money 
for the person that created it because it's his or her money, right? And so there's less of a concern about the remainder beneficiaries. But in these family situations where family members are fighting in guardianship court, that is a concern that's often raised. Um, the fourth scary thing about Florida guardianships is we just spent all your money fighting uh, or your spouse and your kids spent all your money fighting over who's going to control you and your property. Um, this is a great concern to many judges, right? True and it's sometimes not true. In Florida, we have a very specific law that talks about what expenses shall be paid for in a guardianship by the ward, the person who's the subject of the guardianship. Um, the guardian is entitled to get compensation from the ward's money. The guardian's lawyer is entitled to get compensation from the ward's money. It's got to be reasonable. It can't be excessive. Um, and in some instances, people who benefit the ward can receive um, attorney's fees. Limited circumstances. Um, what you need to be careful about is many times you'll have factions fighting, maybe a second or third spouse fighting with adult children from a prior relationship. They're fighting over that spouse or their dad or their mom, and they're fighting over who's gonna control mom or dad, who's gonna be the guardian, who's gonna control the property, who's gonna be guardian of the property. And what judges are very cautious about, and rightfully so, is these people go to mediation, they settle the case, they agree who's going to be guardian of the person, who's going to be guardian of the property, and they say, all our lawyers get paid for, uh, get paid from the ward's funds, from mom or dad's funds. Um, and that's not always right, right? Um, that's typically not always right, and, and increasingly, um, probate court judges are doing the right thing and saying, uh, you know, hold on, you know, why should I use the ward's money to pay the lawyers, and you folks were just fighting, fighting, fighting. So you need to be mindful of that. Um, what we advise clients here who interview our firm for a guardianship matter that's going to be in litigation is that you really should be paying your lawyers and your expenses with your own fees. And if you render some type of a benefit for mom or dad for the ward, if you uh, render some type of benefit, uh, if there's some help provided, um, or you end up being a guardian uh, of the person of the property, then ask the court permission, right? File a motion for fees and ask the court permission um, on whether you can be reimbursed your attorney's fees for the legal proceedings. Um, five, the fifth um, scary thing about a Florida guardianship, and then we'll conclude, is, is a controversial one and kind of a, from a legal standpoint or an estate planning standpoint, kind of a scary one, right? Um, we just changed your whole estate plan. Um, there is a really unique body of law under Florida guardianship law for getting a divorce and whether you can get a divorce while you're incapacitated or not, or whether you can get your marriage annulled and whether you can change someone's estate plan or you can make gifts. So suffice it to say, this is almost a, a micro subject um, of Florida guardianship law. Let's say you have a will and a trust and a power of attorney. Maybe you've amended your trust. Maybe you've restated your trust a couple of times. Maybe you cut some family members out or maybe you put them back in or maybe you change your trustee. What happens sometimes is people will try to use the guardianship court or lawyers will try to use the guardianship court to change your estate plan and say, um, Judge, um, John shouldn't be trustee of the revocable trust because that trust amendment that appointed John as trustee is void. And then you get into a situation of, well, do we need to litigate the validity of that trust document? And, and is now the proper time? And is the guardianship court the proper form? Is it the proper place to do that? Um, so um, what's scary is you've got people coming in and asking a probate court judge to set aside a trust or to void a will or to say, I want you to declare this power of attorney is invalid. Um, and what can happen sometimes is your whole estate plan can change. Um, and so that's kind of frightening, right? Um, and it's even more frightening if 
all family members or all beneficiaries who are affected by these legal wranglings aren't given notice and an opportunity to be heard. Um, and if you don't hear from the estate planning lawyer, because at the end of the day, if you're trying to avoid or invalidate a will or a trust or a power of attorney in guardianship court, don't you want to hear from, hear testimony from your estate planning lawyer who drafted all these documents? Uh, don't you want to hear testimony of what your intent is? Um, and is setting aside or avoiding those documents in a guardianship court even proper? Um, and, and, and if somebody does set aside a will or a trust, can you get it reversed, either through the appellate process or through a, um, a motion under the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure? <clears throat> uh, in conclusion, uh, Florida guardianship law is very serious. It's evolving. It's growing. We're learning more and more about the process. We're getting more and more written opinions from our appellate courts in Florida. Um, regrettably, it's expensive when it's um, litigated, when it's contentious, when it's disputed, um, and it can be stressful, right? One thing that we try to tell prospective clients when they interview the trial attorneys and appellate lawyers at our, our law firm is that um, you, you need to be prepared emotionally uh, and also financially, because uh, there's no guarantees. Um, and most people find litigation stressful. I mean, we do this every single day, all the lawyers here in our firm. We're used to it, we're trained for it. Um, we actually like this area of the law. Uh, we're focused, we're limited. Um, but for a, a second or third spouse, or an adult child, a daughter, a son, um, they're not typically doing this every day. This is an entirely new arena that they're entering. Uh, and they can find it a little stressful and even a little frustrating. Um, so that concludes my remarks about five scary things under Florida guardianship law. My name is John Pinkowski, Pinkowski Hauser, uh, phflorida.com. If you have any questions about these matters, feel free to give us a call, 561 514 -0900, extension 101. Thank you for listening and watching.